Hello and welcome to our Facebook Live. So excited to have MC Carter with us again today. So for anyone that is listening to this after we did the live, hello and welcome. Um, we'll just give everyone a few minutes to get online. But today we're going to be talking about the three gears of digital marketing. Two days ago, we spoke about the first step, which is strategy. And today we're going to be talking about presence. So MC, for those few people, and I'll use the word few people that don't know who you are, um, <laughs> give us a little bit of background about who MC is and, and how long have you been serving the accounting and bookkeeping space? Sure. Uh, and hi, everyone again, and uh, great to be with you again, Nick. Okay, so I've been working in digital marketing for accountants specifically. We founded Paradox 11 years ago. And then almost 20 years ago, I co-founded Business Fitness, which is helping accounting firms be more efficient. And then in 1995, I was actually part of Results Accountants Systems in writing the content and the systems for the first accountants bootcamp wave way back then. So if you add all of that up, it's almost 30, year, 30 years that I've been advising accounting firms. So you started young. You started young. So obviously, <laughs> <laughs> a couple of days ago, we spoke about obviously the three gears of digital marketing. The first one being strategy. Um, I personally learned a lot, got a lot of positive feedback. For anyone that hasn't watched that, you can go back onto our Facebook page and just watch the first one around strategy. Highly recommend that. But today, I'm really excited to talk about the second part. We're getting into a bit more meat on the bones, NC. So we're going to be talking about presence. So first up, what do you mean by presence? Well, presence it describes the first impressions that your business makes when someone first discovers it. So in particular, your online presence. And people might think, oh, yeah, that means my website. Well, it includes your website, but it's so much more than that. So it includes everything from your name of your business, your brand name, your logo, colors, your whole visual style. Yes, the website, but also social media. So your social media accounts, how well they're set up and designed, but even how your brand appears in Google search results, it's all part of the initial first impression that people get when they first discover you online or, or Google something and then find you. There's so many areas I could take this down and and because um, I look at a lot of obviously accounting and bookkeeping firms globally at their online presence. Mm. but. I'm not going to answer this because I could. I'll probably talk all day, and I'll, I won't be giving the right information. But where do accountant firms go wrong with their online presence? Where do you see, as an expert in this area, them going wrong? Yeah, you're right. There are a lot of angles that we could answer that on. First thing I'll talk about: if you look at the most successful clients that we've advised over the years at Paradox, so you know this includes firms like Growthwise and Consolidate and change accountants, white, white and black, they've all got, I use the term, they've got design in their DNA. And by that, I mean, they appreciate and value the role that design, you know, the visual aspects play in business. And in the same way that there's literacy in say financial literacy, there's also design literacy. And I think it's a case, Nick, of a lot of accountants, you know, design's not their thing and that's, that's normal, right? So a lot of accountants don't know what they don't know got unconscious incompetence, it's called, about design. So they underinvest in it or they go, where can I get a cheap $5 logo or I'll get my daughter some work experience kid uh, to do the logo. And they end up, I use the analogy, if your branding was like a, an outfit, you know, clothing, a lot of accounting firms look like a cheap crumpled suit and that doesn't help them attract quality clients. Yeah, I think that, uh, and I had a client ask me this. I use this story at a lot of presentations. I talk about where they asked me for my opinion on on their brand. They were finding it challenging to attract um, innovative accountants and, and the type of employee that they wanted for their team. And I said to them, I said, look, your website, you know, politely sucks. Your office... Um, <laughs> at least it's you, sucking politely. <laughs> well, they, well, they know that I'm, you know, they know that I'm fairly black and white. I'll, if you ask me for an opinion, I'll give it to you. And Good. I said to him, I said, your office hasn't been updated for 25 years. I said, but, you know, you, you look really stale and old, but you're one of the most innovative firms I know, but your brand doesn't mm. reflect that. And I yes. think that's really the key part. And that probably leads me to that next question. What, are, what do you see as the main components of presence for an accounting firm? Like what are, like I obviously mentioned offices then, I mentioned websites, mm. but what are the main parts of presence for you? 
I think one way to explain this is just with a quick story where in the past, because we do blogging for people, we do content driven marketing, email newsletters, social posts. Over the years, over the last decade or so, when people come to us and say, I want your blogging, I want this, and we would have to issue tough love, we call it, I'd say to them, look, it's never comfortable for someone to tell someone else that their baby is ugly. Yes. But it's our <laughs> job to tell you if your baby is ugly and your branding. And we went through a period where if we said, look, really, your brand is hurting you visually, it needs redesign, we'd give them a quote, and they'd say, oh, do I, I don't really want to spend that money, let's just do the blogging. And it never, ever, ever worked as well, because the goal of your content is to attract people to your website who then convert, who then go forward. And conversion gets killed by bad brand because people make a decision about whether they like something in a nanosecond. You know, Malcolm um, Gladwell's book, Blink, talks about how very quickly decisions are made. And the interesting thing about design is design is actually interpreted by a part of the brain that doesn't even have a verbal function. So no one's going to come to you and go, you know, I picked you over the other six accountants that I looked at online because I liked your color palette. Like they're not going to say that unless they're graphic designers. <laughs> but their subconscious will think, I really... I really like that. So the quick example recently, now we don't allow people to come through our process until they've done their strategy and then until they've got their presence in shape, these first impressions. And not that long ago, I was talking to a gentleman, sole practitioner firm in Brisbane, and his logo and colours were terrible, terrible. You know, the classic old navy blue from about early to mid-1990s, and it looked like a piece of clip art. And I said to him, can I ask, who designed your logo? And he said, oh, our um, graphic design lady. Lady was the word he used, not mine. And I said, oh, so what do you mean by your graphic design lady? Oh, you know, the woman, she does all our design. And I said, respectfully, can I ask, is she a qualified graphic designer? And he went, well, what do you mean? I said, does she do nothing but graphic design day in, day out? He went, well, she's the wife of our IT guy. And I said, look. I could tell that's a very amateur effort. And the other amateur efforts, just briefly, Nick, that I see too, is where people use these crowdsourcing sites where they, you know, there's been plenty of them over the years, like Fiverr and Crowdspring, et cetera, and, or a design crowd, sorry. And they end up with a really bad design because they get 30 designs for them and they're not actually had the design literacy to pick a winner out of it. You can still, I can pick a cheap logo from about a hundred yards and it's really hurting accounts brands and they don't realize it until they're educated to that. Yeah, I think that's a, a good point. And I know that when with my own accounting and financial planning uh, business years ago, you know, we, I bought a business and we brought it in. It was called, you know, John Smith and Associates. And I went through an incredibly expensive process, I call it, for branding. And at the time, it was a lot of money that I spent and, and I was questioning it. But then the experience that I had over the multiple years where our brand stood out, it wasn't just the plain manila. It was very, you know, unique. And that investment that we made, I look at it back now, at the start, I thought it was a cost and I had to be convinced to do it. That investment we made, you know, paid for itself a hundred times over and it attracted people because we weren't just normal. I know that growth wise and and, you know, a lot of the businesses you've worked with, I've seen their brands flourish and stand out and be unique, mm. which is some of the critical parts. So I know there's five mm. components of presence and we've spoken about this a fair bit. So do you want to talk about what these first ones are? So the first one being a logo, mm -hmm. what are accounting firms doing right and wrong with their logos? Well, apart from getting non-designers to design them or trying to, um, you know, that, design them out of clip art and, and fonts, uh, is not investing fully like a brand. Your visual, here's the thing to just step back on. Your brand is more than the visuals. It includes the visuals. But the best description of a brand I've ever heard is that it's the sum total of the experiences that someone has with your brand. Mm. So it includes the visual, but it's more than that. It's, you know, the way people answer the phone and uh, the tone of your content, all that sort of thing. But what what we do when we recommend a rebrand, people end up with, yes, the logo, a brilliant colour palette that is a unique combination of brand of, of colours that really makes you distinctive. And it gets put into a visual style guide, which is the rules, the do's and the don'ts of how the brand, the logo should be used moving forward so that when the business gets signage done or uniforms or whatever it might be, 
it's consistent. And if people think, oh, isn't that a bit over the top? I remember um, being down at a ZeroCon. And one of the things that I really applaud Zero, the company, for over the years is I think they've raised the bar on design literacy in the accounting profession because I think a lot of businesses looked at how beautiful, and that being the keyword in their brand over the years, yeah. their stuff has been. And a lot more accounting firms now care about that. And the lanyards at this ZeroCon were based on the colour of the state that you were from. This is in Australia for those in yeah. another country. And someone was saying, oh, I'm from Queensland. Shouldn't my lanyard be maroon? You know, the, mm. the colour of Queensland sporting teams. And I said, you know what? It never will be because it's not in their colour palette. And they mm. are 100% have design in their DNA and they stick to that incredibly strictly. So that's a long way of saying people just need to... Uh, hitch their wagon to a design professional who does all their stuff moving forward so that you get that amazing consistency and that factor that makes people go wow in that initial nanosecond and yeah, no, i 100% agree with that so i mean the big area is obviously websites so this is obviously what i call the virtual receptionist it's normally the first area a client does go and or a prospective client go and check out it's obviously a big one what are some tips for accounting firms here mc Wow. Okay. Don't write <laughs> the content copy. yourself. Don't write yep. the content yourself. So just as design is a profession, so is copywriting. You know, people who, for a living, write words that persuade and, and influence. But on the design side of things, personally, if you want to stand out from the crowd, don't go to a cookie cutter templated website provider who churns out hundreds of websites for accountants each year, unless you want to look like the other hundreds of accountants. Um, that they do sites for each year. And these are ones where they've got a standard layout. They'll change the colors. They'll put your logo in the corner instead of the template one, change a few images, and, hey, you've got a website. Well, you do have a website, but you don't make a strong first impression because you just look same, same, same as everyone else. So the other thing is to use a good platform. When I started talking to the accounting profession about content-driven marketing and new ways of marketing and started talking about WordPress. There was not one provider in the accounting profession globally that was actually building websites on WordPress because they all had their little proprietary system, that, uh, website platform that they used. And the reason they did that, that I would explain to anyone who'd um, want to know, is that way they could lock you into their overpriced hosting because their whole system was designed to get the monthly recurring revenue and lock you in. So WordPress is great for SEO. It's a free platform, but it's not free to get someone to design a WordPress website. And, you know, it really, to hark back, Nick, to last week, it's got to start with strategy. So it's you've got to have really clear target audiences, very clear um, outcomes and benefits, and make sure that your value proposition, which is what people see at the top of the website when they first come, smashes it out of the park by explaining what you do, for whom, and why people should choose you. Yeah, and I think it's so important and particularly where I was talking about that, uh, I suppose, example I used earlier about the stale brand. And I see that in so many accounting businesses now. They're, you know, innovators or, you know, we're new age accountants. It's like, well, how? You know, what's the statement? I mean, yeah, everyone's using it. I think that visual branding and, you know, we talked, you talked a lot about strategy in our um in our live a couple of days ago. So for anyone that hasn't watched that, I highly recommend you go back and watch that. It's the first mm. cog of the three gears of digital marketing. But, you know, once you've got the strategy, it's about implementation. And I think this comes down to the social media aspect is we could probably talk again for hours on this one. And it's probably the one where when I talk to a lot of accountants, they say, oh, look, I'm never going to get anything. You know, we post things. Or when I do look at people's social medias, it's just – you know, it's the same stuff that, you know, it's corporate lingo. It's not actually trying to interact and connect and, and mm. nurture and build people. So, you know, when it comes to social media, I either see firms doing it really well, which is a very small percentage, or mm. majority don't do it, or they just mm. have, you know, standard comments basically being, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk calls it, you know, you should be going hook, hook, jab. Um, or sorry, jab, jab, hook, other way around. But most people are just punching people in the face all day trying to sell them, <laughs> sell, 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 sell. Yeah, sell yeah. Doesn't get across. I mean, what does, I suppose, the social media, how how, are, how does that help an accounting firm's presence and mm. where do you see people doing it really well? Okay, well, on lots of different levels, the first thing that everyone needs to keep in mind, it's called social media. First word, social. So always use the analogy of if you were at a 
uh, a dinner with friends or a barbecue or some gathering, don't put in anything into social media that wouldn't come out of your lips to another person. So keep it natural mm. language. You don't want to sound like brochure speak, corporate speak, like you said before, Nick. And, you know, say the things out loud before you post them and think, would I actually say that? If the answer is no, don't post it. And, you know, imagine being at a barbecue where someone turned to you and said, Yes, I'm a trusted advisor with 73 years of experience, <laughs> combined experience in our firm, and you know, we really oh, you go, can yeah, I walk I, off now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you know the other yeah. mistake. Another mistake I see in social media is fig jam, the old acronym of far out. I'm good. Uh, yep. Just ask. Just ask. Just me. ask me. Yeah. So people are bragging, you know, and they're doing it indirectly with photos of showing them their feet up on a you know cocktail table by the side of a pool and. Yeah. That's a, or, you know, the classic one, sitting on a beach or by a beach with a laptop, a great way to ruin a laptop, go to the beach. Yeah. So don't post that sort of BS. <laughs> Just be real. And here's one, a really good tip. Um, there's a brilliant book um, about, it's called Story Brand. And uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, Donald, someone. Anyway, he talks about you're not the hero. Make your prospects a hero. You're the guide. Love it. Yeah. So use your social media to shine the light on your clients and be really clear. Don't try to use, you know, six or seven different platforms because you probably won't use them well. Use ones that A, will help you reach your target markets. B, that you share some sort of affinity for yourself or at least someone on your team who's going to drive it. And decide for each platform, here's how we're going to use it. So, for example, if you've got a Facebook page, don't just put it up there and, you know, hope that people will come. Use it to... Uh, do client stories, you know, shine the light on your successful clients. And it doesn't always have to be a clear example of success because, you know, they've just won an award. It might be, hey, they're just implementing a really cool point of sale system that flows through to their cloud accounting. Just little things like that where you're not saying, you know, far out, I'm good, just ask me all the time. You're shining the light on others. So keep it light, keep it interesting, keep it story-based and, yeah, don't make it sound like anything that would just be in a brochure because that's just a waste of time. Yeah, and I, I love the barbecue talk. The other way that I look at it is when you go to a party, you wouldn't just walk in there and jump up on the table and start selling. You build relationships, you nurture. It's, you know, you've got to do, I mean, you've got to think like you're going to a party. This is a virtual party. It's a different yeah. party. Yeah, and, you know, that book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, like uh, Dale Carnegie's yep. famous book, the best conversationalists actually just ask questions. So that's yep. another great tool in social media is just say, hey, what's everyone using for X? Or, yep. you know, what do people prefer, this or this? And get a conversation going by asking questions. And, again, just like a conversation, if you sat next to someone at a barbecue or a party and uh, all they ever did is talk about themselves, hmm, you'd be looking for someone else to talk to. Yeah. So, I mean, for anyone that is on um, today's video that hasn't been listening to the whole thing so far, we're talking about the three gears of digital marketing. We spoke about strategy a couple of days ago. So if you have not watched that one, highly recommend you jump onto our Facebook page and, and watch that one. And then you can obviously it will put more context into what we're talking about today, which is the presence part. The mm -hmm. other part, um, MC, that I really see a lot of with social media um, is it's cluttered. Like if you go into an Instagram feed or a Twitter feed or a Facebook feed, there's obviously just, you know, millions and millions of posts. How do you stand out? How do you mm. hook them to want to look at your thing? Yeah, there's a few layers to that. Number one, very specific <laughs> audience. So everyone yeah. give up the idea that your target market is small business. That's like saying heartbeats. Like yeah, it's anyone with too, a heartbeat. <laughs> it's too broad, way too broad. So very specific yep. audience and very specific topics. And what you want is to have your content be helpful, you know, solving real problems. So uh, educational content. I've always said over the years, I remember doing the flip chart at our first masterclass over a decade ago and writing the word marketing up on the flip chart and then asking people their word association with it and, you know, all the negatives from accounting firms come out about, oh, you know, it's all about spin and it's about selling and it's about that. And I just crossed it out and said, look, delete it from your brain and replace it with education. If you think about who do I need to educate about what for them to even understand how we can really help them to a better future with advisory, well, they're the topics that your content should be about. You know, other things too, Nick, you know, the imagery that you use, you know, interesting images. Yep. One thing, here's a great way to not stand out. Use templated content that hundreds of other firms are using out there and just spew that out. Um, yeah, doc images. Not, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, we, we do a fair bit of work with um, 
lately with uh, Kelly Partners, a listed company, and they've got a rule yeah. within their brand style guide. They will never use any stock photography ever. Right. It's always got to be real photography. Now, not everyone necessarily has a budget for that, but even there's an art in choosing stock photography. You know, some of that stock photography just looks like stock photography. Like if I ever walk into a cafe and see five people, each from different, you know, racial backgrounds, all mm. pointing at a laptop, smiling, yeah. I'm going to take a photo of it. Because I'm going to go, hey, wow, those people from the stock photos actually exist, which of course they don't. So yeah. Yeah, you can choose stock photos that look more authentic anyway. Um, but you know, I reckon it pays for every accounting firm, every small business out there to find a relationship with a local photographer. Because a lot of mm. photographers don't necessarily charge a lot. There's such a low barrier to entry to start a photography business get yourself a camera and a shingle and you're out there yeah. um, so that you've got that ability to have good photos taken uh, on a regular basis and it's no big deal. It's just part of your workflow and content. Mm. I always um, use, I, I listen to a lot of Russell Brunson from ClickFunnels. Not sure if you follow him at all, but if you see the images he posts, a lot of them are him or his family or his, you know, people from ClickFunnels and it's always doing something you know, I'll say silly or, you know, it's something that you don't normally see, but I it always captures my attention. I'm like, hang on, what, what's he doing there? And I'll look to, I see a lot of posts with the, the typical stock image and you're like, huh, looks boring, just keep going. So you've got to really hit them and, and get them, but in a way that associates with your brand. He does that because that associates with him. And, um, you know, back to design, one of the things that uh, good designers that we use uh, talk about is the brand fingerprint. So actually, you, you at Tower Global, your images always have a, a particular filter applied to the images, which looks great, looks consistent, that vignette of blue over the top. And within anyone's brand, you can do that so that once you have templates set up in something like Canva, by the way, um, to everyone here is you can save these filters and with one click, someone who's not necessarily a highly skilled graphic designer, but has been given the templates by someone who is, can very quickly create really great quality uh, images if they've got those guidelines for consistency for the brand. But you know, one thing that I should mention to everyone is uh, the link that I'll mention in a moment to a, ch a checklist on boring versus non-boring branding <laughs> for accountants. It goes to a blog post called The Professionalism Paradox. And yeah. I, we're called Practice Paradox because I think a lot of the truths in lives lie behind a paradox where the paradox seems uh, untrue or self-contradictory on the surface, but when you think it through, is actually true. And the professionalism yeah. paradox is where accounting firms have confused the meaning of the word professional to mean conservative and boring. And that's not what professionalism in the modern age means. You know, you need to have an edge. You need to have a unique look, feel, and message. And that does not mean boring unless your strategy has worked out that, yeah, we really are targeting people who love boring accountants. Then be boring. Yeah, if that's your niche, then go for serve them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So but, you know, I'll just put that. I'll put that link in the comments for anyone that wanted to go and have a look at that. I, I had a read of it earlier, and it's fascinating. And I just learned something then, MSC. I didn't even know that we were putting whatever those shades or whatever you call it. So I'm glad that. I mean, we do have a style guide, and we have very structured ways. So you know, even I learned something just then. <laughs> yeah, your marketing team's to be congratulated. They're doing great work. Yeah. Um, no, in, in that article, by the way, the professionalism paradox, which is a long blog post, in there we also talk about brand names. I, I used, used to joke from stage, I say, oh, you know, it's really hard when you're starting an accounting firm and let's say there's two of you or even if it's just your own and you're up all night going, oh, should it be our names and partners or our names and associates? It's such a hard decision, just tongue in cheek. <laughs> um, and sure, that's a traditional way of naming firms, is yep. surname, surname and whatever. Carter and Carter and associates or Carter and Carter or... <laughs> yeah, you know, if, if you look down that um, blog post, I've got... Here are some cut through brands and we show their logos, et cetera. Yeah. And we show here's what their name would be with traditional naming and here's what their name actually is. And when you run your eye down that list, it's clear that when you've got a name that embodies the, the meaning, the essence, the metaphor, whatever it is, it stands out. That immediately says to someone who's looking for something different, something that uh, beyond what their previous accountant has done, it all adds up to them thinking, oh, that's a little different. They're not just your traditional doing yeah, things account. the way things have been done for the last hundred years. You know? 
So we put a link to that blog into the comments. So we're going to talk about blogs. So we've talked about logos. We've talked about visual branding. We've talked about websites. We've talked about social media. Now, blogging. Is it still worthwhile blogging? There's lots of talk about, you know, social media and all these other areas now. And, you know, I've seen a lot of people that were blogging, you know, potentially dropping it off. So what's the importance of that fifth component being blogging? Blogging is still important if your content is good content. If it's <laughs> generic content, blah, 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 uh, no, it's probably not worth doing. But Google, from an SEO perspective, so uh, from the perspective of having your website rank well for certain searches, blogging is crucial because people won't always enter your website from the homepage. Your homepage is a bit like the main door to the building. Sure, plenty of people will come in the main door, but blogging gives your virtual building, your business, all these other potential doors that people can come in through. So one of the things that's part of strategy, Nick, that we guide people on is what are the key words? What are the phrases that you want your business to rank really well for in Google? Because if you're not in the top three at the top of page one, you're pretty much not in the game. And what we see, Nick, when people come to us, we look at their website data and their website traffic is often 100 or 200 a month. And that's just not enough. It'd be like a cafe or a restaurant that just doesn't have enough people walk in the door. But once their website traffic in terms of unique visitors per month gets over 1,000 and then in particular over 2,000 a month, then there's enough volume coming in onto the website for it to turn into a true consistent lead generation tool for them. So if they're really clear on their main topics that they want to rank well for, then you can have blog posts written that are designed to rank well for those. Now, that is brilliant because a blog post is often an evergreen topic. And to explain that to everyone who haven't heard it, just means it won't date quickly. So it'll work for you this month, next month. A good blog post, you should probably revise your main blog post probably every year, but they will work for you for years to come. And then when you promote them in social media and other people reshare, retweet those social posts, it actually creates additional links called backlinks back to your site, which Google sees as signals of good content, of quality. And Google, believe it or not, is actually in the job of serving up when people do a search, highly relevant, excellent content. That's the game that they're in that allows them to, to make the money yeah. that they make. So they want good content. Uh, another thing that people do, Nick, is just do really brief, rubbish blog posts that don't really add any value. Yeah, you know, no you, one reads. <laughs> they might have a good headline. Or, for mm. heavens, don't do any clickbait headlines that are a bit misleading. But you click through, you go to the article, and it's about this long. Yeah. And Google, Google uh, considers that a thin page. And thin pages are useless for your business because Google won't list them because there's um, not enough meat on the bones, to use that phrase. Mm. So there's obviously lots that we've covered off in the second gear of digital marketing, which is obviously around presence. So again, we've talked about logo, visual branding, website, social media. We've just touched on blogging. Do you? We've got to wrap up in a couple of minutes, but do you have any examples of of how a stronger brand or a stronger presence has helped accounting firms that you've worked with? Do you have a quick example you could give of of a client or two that you've been able to change their presence? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and by the way, with everyone thinking here is, oh, I don't, we don't want to change our name. You might, not, you might not have to, right? Or we don't even want to change our logo. Often we do what are called brand refreshes, where we make things look a lot more modern, but it's still recognizable as being the previous business. So uh, an example that comes to mind and someone who really understands design is uh, white and black or white black is their web address, whiteblack.com.au. And when he came to us, the website had been done by one of these cookie cutter websites for accountants um, providers. There's a really cool tool that I love called Wayback Machine. If people search Wayback Machine, it's an archive of screenshots of uh, websites in the past. And this site, when it came to us, was um, had an image at the top, a stock photo image of a bunch of color pencils and one pencil standing out. And the headline was, put some color into your accounting. <laughs> Save me. Um, Way back, Michelle. We're going to have a look at that. You can, you can imagine, right? You can imagine someone in business, small business, and they wake up this morning and they say to their partner, you know what we need? We need to put some color into our accounting. <laughs> Not. Um, so what we did with um, white and black is we did a refresh of the logo to make it look 
more professional than what it was. And we redid their value proposition and the design of the website and their message so that they really resonate with their message, which they worked out through our framework of targeting people who had online businesses, particularly in that Amazon space. And now he says people, uh, when they chat to him live, one of the first things they say is, man, you are speaking my language. I've been looking for an accountant who gets what we do. Uh, so that's a good website to look at because it ticks a lot of the boxes that we're talking about in this series. Excellent. So we've obviously covered a lot of content today. We're coming up to the end of time. So the three gears of digital marketing, we covered strategy a couple of days ago. And for anyone that hasn't watched that, jump onto our Facebook Live. The video is there. Today we talked about presence. Um, there is a download in the comments section for you. Make sure you download that. Have a read of that. Um, we've covered a lot of content. Um, I've learned a lot today, MC, as I always do. We are running the third one next Tuesday for anyone in Australia or Monday if you're in North America. What are we going to cover off in the third gear on Tuesday, MC? We're going to cover what I call cadence. And this is the stage that people often start at. So if someone goes through this series, the very least, Nick, we're going to save them a lot of time, effort and money. Because if you start in the third gear, I remember learning to drive and you're at the T intersection and you go to start and you're in third gear, it doesn't work so well. Yes. Same with your marketing. So we're going to look at what is the content aspect of marketing and the fact that everything we've talked about so far, strategy and presence gets you to the start line and yep. cadence is where the rubber hits the road and where lead generation actually starts. Awesome. So I'm excited for that, MC. As always, appreciate your time, your knowledge, your experience. I've had fun today, as I always do, and look forward to chatting to you again next Tuesday. I've enjoyed it again too, Nick. I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Cheers.